Don't certainly lie to Red Hammer. This is the second version, the second edition of Don't Certainly Light. The original game came out a couple of years ago. Um, the original game was the sequel of uh, another game by Lock and Load game. And that one was um, Course Command Tot and Sontag. The game has been redone in a second edition, so now we also have a second edition of the second installment. In reality, the games are pretty different. Uh, the general engine is similar but the topic is different and the, the scale of the game feels very different. This is a bigger game um, that takes longer to play. It has also more replay value, more scenarios than the original Totten Sontag had. The topic, uh, it's a fictional what-if scenario. It's a World War, War III uh, happening in Central Europe in 1985. So we have NATO troops uh, fighting it in the battlefield against the troops of the Warsaw Pact. The Cold War just got hot and you have to fight it out. Luckily enough, nobody has started nuking each other just yet. So we actually uh, can have a tactical, um, I wouldn't say tactical, but we have um, a war game, which is not tactical, but at the operational level. Let me show you how the game works. This is one of the maps in the game. There are two maps. This is a small one, there's a large one. And the map that you use depends on the scenario that you have decided to play. There are several scenarios in the rule book. The maps are functional, they work well. They are in fairly thick paper. I don't think you'll need a plexiglass, piece of plexiglass on them. At least I didn't use one. As for the graphics, there is something in on these maps that, to me, it looks like they tried to be modern and it came out a little cartoonish or maybe it's just because the cities look like they're glowing or they're radioactive or something. But the maps are certainly functional. There's a small one as I said and here you have a larger one which actually is made of two separate maps that you will place adjacent to one another. Map has a turn track, of course very very important. Here we go. And each turn is basically a day and then each turn, if you want to call them that, or is divided in days, and each day is divided in impulses. Actually, technically, this should be called couplets because in each unit of the game, each player gets an impulse. So each, each impulse that you see here is divided in actually two players' impulses, one per player. Uh, what is interesting is what happens in those impulses. So at the beginning of each uh, couplet, so both players roll a die, a d6, and they use the result to determine their activation number for that impulse. Suppose I roll the 3, then I place my marker here. I'm the NATO player. Or I rolled another number, whatever. I place the marker wherever it applies, uh, the marker there counter. If you roll the 6, you may notice that there isn't a 6 there, then actually that means that you botch stuff, then you need to roll on this table here, unless you are playing this specific scenario, then there is another table. But you roll on this table here, and that determines the random event that happens, then you simply have to follow the instructions there and to implement the instructions. Otherwise, usually, um, you simply place the uh, counter indicating your activation number and that influences two things one in the number of movement points that you have the number of movement points is always your activation number plus one but it is nice that there is a reminder here so you know that that turn all of your units if you got a three all of your units can move only up to four movement points on the other hand Units that are represented by counters such as this one have an initiative number here, which is the last one. And in a turn, the only units that you will be able to activate are the ones with an activation number which is uh, higher than or equal to your activation number. Uh, actually, the number on the counter is called the initiative. So the initiative needs to be equal to or higher than. Which means if I am if I rolled a low result, say I rolled a 2, then I will be able to activate everybody in my army, or almost everybody, because everybody or almost everybody has an initiative number which is equal to or higher than 2. But they will not move by much, only 3 movement points. If I rolled a 4, then fewer 
units will be able to activate because units that for example have a three as an activation number won't be able to do anything that turn but the units that do activate that is the ones with higher initiative will be able to move far and in this case up to five memory points each so there definitely is an interesting trade-off there uh, which i guess represents some sort of like limited command command imagine uh, it is a um, resource as a currency that you can invest in different ways you can activate a lot of units but then not they don't get to act much or you can uh, concentrate it on fewer units and they get to move further units that activate can move and or attack movement like in most war games uh, simply what happens on the map you move units from one hex to the other you spend movement points as you go the terrain that you enter and the exercise that you cross will uh, create limitations will change the expenditure of movement points you can also attack enemies and that is pretty important because that's what the game is about after all it's about fighting now what happens here is that there are two types of attack one is an overrun attack which happens during your movement phase you move adjacent to an enemy by the way you need to project as on a control so you have to stop when you move adjacent to an enemy but to attack during your movement phase you move adjacent to an enemy you spend an extra movement point and then uh, you perform your attack right there and right then. Correction, what I meant to say is that you need to spend uh, the number of movement points that is necessary to enter the hex of the attacker. So if you still have movement points, you can perform an overrun attack. Otherwise, uh, the uh, attack is called an assault and it is performed by units that started adjacent to, the, to an enemy unit. To resolve combat, uh, you, well, this is unusual. There are a couple of unusual features here. One, which I actually like very much, is defensive fire, which is this unit may be attacking this unit here, but this unit may still get hurt. You roll two dice, uh, two d6s, and the number that you roll, before you even worry if you hit or not, needs to be compared to a list of possible numbers represented defensive fire. That is, if a packed unit is attacking a NATO unit and it rolls a 7, before the attack is resolved, the packed unit takes a hit from the NATO unit and you simply lose a step for that unit. Units, yes, lose steps by being flipped to the other side. And they remove when they take, on, take a second. Hit. If the a NATO unit is attacking a packed unit and it rolls a 4, then the NATO unit takes a defensive hit. So the attack of the NATO unit is interrupted, you record the damage that it takes, and then you resolve the attack that you initiated. So as you can see, with 4 versus uh, 7, the pact is much more likely to take hits from NATO units than vice versa. There are also other numbers that may determine defensive hits. For example, if an infantry unit in close terrain, such as say a town, uh, is attacked, then it also inflicts a defensive hit on when the attacker rolls a 2 or a 3 or an 11. And an armor unit in clear terrain inflicts also a defensive unit to the attacker when the attacker rolls a 2 or a 3 or an 11. So it's not that really you as the defender have anything to do there. You simply look and see what happens. It's not like one of those games where the defender gets to really do stuff. But it is nice. I would say that uh, you can still inflict units it hits on the opponent even when it is not your turn. This is particularly important in case, say, for some units that you that you had on the map with low initiative, you haven't been able to activate them for a while, they've been sitting there, but they're not sitting ducks because they're not just standing there and taking poundings from the opponent. They can still uh, defend themselves and the opponent may still be reduced even if you haven't activated a unit. So, you roll the dice, you check and say this is what we rolled. You roll the die as you're attacking, you check to see if there was defensive fire. You may have to adjust the um, firepower of the attacker. The firepower is the first number that you see there on the counter. The, third, the second number is defense. So you may have to adjust the firepower. You 
uh, to you add uh, the firepower to the number that you rolled on the dice. There are the modifiers that may apply based, for example, on terrain. And if the total of your attack, uh, after you add and take anything into account, is equal to or higher than the defense of the opponent, the opponent takes a hit. As simple as that. Usually units attack individually, but there are recon units that instead of performing an attack can support an attack from a friendly unit and in that case they simply uh, give a bonus to the unit that they are supporting. There are also tactical chits, asset chits, different war games call them in different ways. In this, in this game they're called assets. And uh, like in other games of this kind that includes that include this element, these are drawn randomly and they provide the players with different benefits. Gunship, then you have a special attack uh, which has a counter but it doesn't count as a combat unit which you can use to attack the opponent. You can try to call them see if they listen and if they do then they can attack the opponent airstrike also allows you to attack the opponent and the two sides have different combinations have different symbols and abilities for example the pact has chemicals and when chemicals are played, then the pact can attack without having to fear defensive fire from NATO units. And that is one uh, chit, for example, that is only one side has. So, uh, you have this to add flavor and unpredictability to the game. Now, I am, as well known fact, a fan of Core Command, Tot and Sontag. I really enjoyed that game. And uh, I also enjoyed Dawn's Early Light the first time that it came out. Now come to think of it, I don't know why I didn't review it back then. Uh, it's a good game. It's a game that I enjoy. It is reminiscent of, uh, of Totem Sontag, if you know that game. Uh, but it also has more meat. Uh, I guess that maybe the first time I played, somehow I wasn't completely convinced by the taste of the extra meat. I usually like meat. Um, Meaning that I love the uh, immediacy, the simplicity, the crystal clear um, concepts uh, behind Totten Sontag. Well, see, there are a couple of original ideas. It is very approachable, very easy to play. Um, Dawn's Early Light, starting from its first incarnation, added extra rules, for example, defensive fire and the tactical chits, which I don't know why at the beginning, back then, it wasn't entirely sold on, and nothing against them, but uh, um, they didn't resonate with me very much. But now, I don't know, maybe I'm older, wiser, whatever happened, I enjoy that extra level of complexity. I don't think that it really detracts from uh, the basic engine which remains the same. The space is different because it has more rules and more procedures but also more options. There is more depth um, without really adding any fiddliness. Uh, it still remains a war game for beginners. It can absolutely be your first game that you ever play. The rules are four, five or six pages, something like that. There are some minor or ambiguities there, I would say, but uh, even an inexperienced war gamer can probably rule in all cases of ambiguity, or I don't say ambiguity, it's more like things that are, seem to be taken for granted a little bit, but even an inexperienced war gamer can definitely play and enjoy the game. Uh, it is just, um, there's just more stuff in here, so more rules, uh, but also more depth, more complexity. The tactical cheats are, in fact, pretty nice and fun. And also the great uh, selling point to me is that there are uh, several maps and multiple scenarios. It is a game that has a staying power which is much higher than that of Totten Sontag. Most scenarios will take quite a while to play, um, not Mind you, it's not a monster game. I mean that it will be like an evening, I would say an evening. Uh, if you play fast, if you know how to, then you can probably play uh, more than a single game, unless you're playing a small scenario, then definitely you will be able to squeeze more than one um, in a single play session. What is also good is that the game is 100% solo friendly, uh, even more so thanks to the random activation, the random factor thing. And to me this is really the key point of the, of the game. That activation system is the thing that I like the most. Um, and I like that uh, that in Totten Sontag 2 I really like here. I like the trade-off that you have there between number of units, 
and uh, and uh, capability mobility that the units have so that you always have something to do uh, even though you don't know exactly what and in what measure you're going to be able to act there is fog of war it factors in all sorts of problems you may have at the command and communication level but i definitely like the level of uncertainty that it brings to the game which however is an uncertainty that doesn't throw uh, good playing, good tactics, good planning uh, out of the window because it is simply uh, just the right level of uncertainty that makes things feel right when we're talking about war, a little bit of uncertainty should be there, but at the same time it is fun to play around, to deal with that uncertainty and you still feel that the outcome of the game is uh, for the most part the result of the decisions that you made around that uncertainty rather than simply dictated by, uh, by randomness. And I like how defensive fire works. Uh, you do have to add that extra step, that is, you need to make sure that you check uh, that the role of the attacker, um, whether the role of the attacker triggers defensive fire or not. If that is the case, it is immediately resolved. Combat is resolved in a traditional fashion. Not the most traditional, but a traditional fashion meant, uh, meaning something that we have in many other games. You're basically trying to uh, exceed or match a target number. Something that uh, maybe you see more often in fantasy games where you're trying to hit the armor of the opponent, the role-playing games. But it works well in war games too, as Dawn's or Light demonstrate. I usually prefer historical games uh, about stuff that did happen um, or out there sci-fi fantasy stuff. Of all of my themes, all of my approaches to things to, to game design, uh, or I should say to game themes, uh, histo hypothetical historical conflicts to me are the least interesting uh, that there are. I'll be honest about that. Nevertheless, when they are captured in an interesting game, I can still enjoy them. I'm just saying that if this system was applied to historical events uh, more often, and I hope it will be, like it happened in the first installment of the series, I'd be totally sold on the idea. I would be more than willing to play more games in this system. Uh, it's a system that I enjoy, and actually it's a pity that we only have two games based on that system. I've been waiting for a third installment for quite a while now, since the two games came out not far from one another and then there's there was never a third just reissues but in any case this is um, a game that looks good it looks much better in this new uh, edition here it got a really nice facelift maps are good uh, the counters look particularly good uh, the components are really uh, nothing to to worry about they're good components the rule book uh, um, it's serviceable, if not perfect, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I would say, production-wise, the game is a pretty solid product. Design-wise, the game is a very solid product and in general well I liked it I definitely enjoyed it and there's a lot of enjoyment that you can get out of this also considering all of the various scenarios that you have. Dawn's Early Light Red Hammer by Lock and Load Games. It's nice to see this game around again I can't really remember any major difference from the first edition but it was a good game in the first edition and it still is a good game. Before we conclude, I simply want to take a second to thank some viewers of my videos that back my Kickstarter campaign for 2015. The names are Bjorn Eriksson, Hans Olav Hardang, Michel Journet, Stein, Sirland, and Tony Kron. Thank you to these viewers for backing my campaign and thank you to all of you, my viewers, for watching my videos.